All right, so there's sometimes there's just some things that that are kind of extraordinary. Sometimes you know why, sometimes you don't know why. And when we think about tent, we don't think of anything that fancy. Um, you know, I think of, say, like my, uh, my wedding, you know, we, we were a couple broke kids, didn't spend much on it, so when I think of wedding, I don't always think that expensive. I um, saw an article this week, Hillary Clinton and a few went to a wedding of a couple of uh, India's richest people, and the wedding costs uh, $100 million dollars. For a week-long wedding, it's uh, it's not what I usually think of when it comes to a wedding. But we're going to be getting into the the tabernacle, um, and I tell you, it's a uh, it's a study that I don't have any aspirations of really doing it justice of all that God had to say on this subject. It's, it's one that we could go through as a church, as a, even just as individuals or, or in-depth Bible study, and glean just this massive amount, and then we could go back and learn something new and fresh and even deeper. Uh, the tabernacle is we're going to start getting into these things. Uh, we're just going to slowly just kind of peel a layer off at a time, uh, partially because, as William MacDonald pointed out, uh, there's 50 chapters dealing with the tabernacle in some way or another. And so we don't want to rush in too deep. We have many more chapters to continue the conversation. Um, but it'll tell us a lot of things. It'll tell us about God. We're going to see pictures of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Pictures that have to do with us. We're going to continue to see... Um, Pictures of dealing with our relationship to God, whether it be how we're separated from Him or how we are coming into a relationship with Him. All, a lot of these things are just going to be bubbling out of this, this thing called the tabernacle and the furniture and the different things that exist in it. So leading up to this, Moses, he'd been, as you remember, um, up on the mountain and so Israel had no doubt at this point that God was speaking to, to Moses and um, this was a part of his plan. So he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights and Deuteronomy tells us that he would had no food and no water. Just him and the Lord. What a time. The children of Israel, they're freaking out because it's, to them it's as God is a consuming fire up on this mountain. They are freaking out. But God will be preparing a work in them and through the nation of Israel. But now as they're going to focus in on the tabernacle and the things of it. In this chapter, the tabernacle is called the, the sacred place. It's uh, this place of meeting. It's heat in New King James, King James, whatever, it's called a sanctuary, but it's just a sacred place. But yet in the next chapter, and some other chapters, he's going to call it a tent. The tabernacle is just is interesting, has all these interesting pictures of, of both simplicity, humanity, and also deity and holiness. It's an interesting contrast through, through much of this. You know, many people... Many people have heard about the pyramids or great places of worship in India. Great cathedrals scattered throughout Europe. And, and that would have been me, you know, growing up. You know, going to the Kingdom Hall, we, you know, in our twisted translation. That was. But, um, you know, you'd, you'd have some kind of knowledge of some Bible stories and stuff. But when I, went, I got to go to England as a young man, we were over there being knuckleheads and, and playing football, and, and one of the coolest things I, I found was just some of the old churches and some old cathedrals. I, I, it was really cool. And I could have told you a little bit about them after I was done, but you know, I couldn't tell you anything at that point about the tabernacle, and I can't even, in my memory, think if I'd ever even really heard of it as a younger man. 
But yet we've heard of all these other great places, you know, and in America or some of the modern world, we have our testimonies to our great uh, worship of wealth and our skyscrapers. Some of us, you know, think of Mall of America or something of that nature. But how about the tabernacle? This place of worship, the sacred place that God is going to spend 50 chapters in one way or another discussing with us about. There are very few subjects that God deals that much directly on. It must be awfully important. So verse 1 of chapter 25. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly. With his heart you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair. <laughs> I'm not sure how goat's hair made it in that list, but it did. Ram skins, dyed red, badger skins, and acacia wood. Oil for the light, and spices for the anointing oil. And for the sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show you. That is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. So God's going to be very specific in this tent, this sanctuary, this place of meeting his people, and he has the expectation that they will follow it to the T. Not just that they will throw up the tent or it'll be all right, but it will be exactly as God instructs them. So we have the instructions from the Lord as he's going to start pouring out the instructions, gathering up things that they have no idea why they need them yet. Um, and so he starts it off with um, this offering. There's going to be this work of the Lord. He comes down, he says, there's going to be this work of the Lord. God wants to do this thing, and we need, we need stuff. We need money, we need gold, we need all of these different things. But God says something interesting here. He says, I want, him, I, I want you to get it from the people who give it willingly, with their hearts. Now, much of these things, they, had, they really didn't... They didn't really earn it. I mean, it wasn't necessarily a direct paycheck. It wasn't something that they had just made last week in their farm or whatever. It was stuff that God had given them and blessed them with coming out of Egypt um, for all their years of slavery. Some of this was also probably collected from when they overthrew or took out the Amalekites. And so here they have, and, and I might actually have been a little bit thankful, you know, being a husband, we moved, man, we used to average like moving like once a year for the like first 11 years of our marriage. And so if I didn't have to move that stupid heavy gold thing or thing one more time as we're cruising across the desert, I'd be happy. Let's go ahead and give that to the Lord. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> so, those who are going to willingly offer it. I'm going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. You know, it may have been hard, it may have been easy. I don't really know for the Israelites to give these things up. On one hand, they'd been slaves for hundreds of years. Out in the desert, there's no convenience stores, nowhere to really spend it, so maybe it was easy to give up. It was easy, easy come, easy go. Maybe since they never had anything, perhaps their heart would get more attached to it. You know, I've never been rich before. I, would, I don't want to just give that away. I don't know. But 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12 says, For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has, and not according to what he does not have. And so he, as he's dealing with the Christ, our pattern, giving and distributing among the saints, Paul laid out to them 
from that willing mind, and it's according to what you have and not what you don't have. So as each one would come there in the nation of Israel, or as each one worships the Lord today with that aspect of their finances in their life, it's not the only measurement is from the heart based on what you have to offer to the Lord. It's not based upon how much you have versus the next person that you have, or the net, what the next person has. That same book in, nine, in chapter 9, verse 7, says that, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And cheerful is probably a little bit of an easy translation there. It's, it's hilarious. Someone who, they really, from the heart, they want to give to the Lord. That's what God loves. And he says, when I'm going to do this work, I'm going to do this work in the tabernacle, when I've called this special aspect of your life, man, I want you to be all in. I want you to love this. Not, well, you know, kick the can and whatever. So, man, I want it to be all in. From your heart, from your mind, I want you to love. I want you to love giving to me. Now, it probably really, I only, her person really wouldn't have been that much, and we'll get into that in later chapters about how much it was per person. You know, the whole tabernacle, when it's all weighed out, in modern currency is probably somewhere between 10 and $20 million, give or take on the exchange of gold and silver and all of that. Um, but you had at least 600,000 men giving to it. Um, and so when you break it down per person, it may not have actually been always necessarily that huge of a gift, but God wanted it from the heart because he had a great work to do. And so God wanted them to be a joyful giver. God wanted the offering that was from the heart and willingly. And I believe, you know, I just happen to believe that he, he still wants that today. You know, if, if someone on TV, radio, or up front in the church is applying that pressure, we need, God has to have. Well, go ahead and keep your wallet in your pocket. Keep it, man. I'm, God doesn't want us to give of grudgingly or necessity. <laughs> what does God need that he doesn't have? What do you have that he didn't give you? <laughs> oh, hey, I need that back. It's a part, you know, this is kind of more of a special offering, not necessarily when you deal with day-to-day -day or a part of your life of giving to the Lord or worshiping in that way. Um, but God's just not really into arm-twisting and all that nonsense that people are, are doing. Because he doesn't need it. What, what were they going to give him right now that he didn't first give them? What are we going to give that he didn't first give us? Because it's, it's just not, a, it's not about his necessity. So, the Lord says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this picture, this precious, amazing picture that we're going to, I hope that we have such an appreciation for before we end this book. And he says, I want you to partner with me in this. I want you to be invested in this. I want your heart, your mind, everything that you have invested in that. And it includes the treasures. <laughs> now, you know, if these guys, I mean, they got millions of dollars coming out of Egypt or out of the war. And, it, you know, this was, you know, really a fraction back. Probably, I don't know, less than 50 bucks per person that they were given back. To the Lord to be in this. Some gave more. I mean, if you figured man, woman, child, a um, couple million into a couple into about twenty million dollar tent. Um, now, where was I going with that? A picture. So the Lord is going to draw a picture, and He wants them to be all in with this. Oh, that's where I was going. <laughs> As the Lord gives to us and we want to have that heart and be invested, when He calls us to put into a work or a unique thing or something He's going to do in our life and He wants us to be that joyful giver. You know, I think of as they freely received all this, people today, when they win the lottery, how much, how much do they give back to the government? 
I mean, when you win the lottery, just straight off the top, what is it, close to 50%? So if you want a million dollars, you're going to get about $500,000. You're going to give about half of that to the government, uh, let alone the family that keeps, comes knocking or, <laughs> or whoever. You know, the Lord had given them hundreds of millions of dollars worth of stuff, probably, coming out of Egypt. And this was just a, such a small thing. And he says, you know, of all that the Lord gives to us, any time we give, it's such, a, it's such a small thing. And he doesn't need it. He wants us to partner, to, to pour into his, the work because we love it and because he's called us to it. Anyways, moving on. So the most important thing is it's, it's a picture and it teaches us about the Lord and it also trains us to be like him. When we want to have that heart to freely give, to be all in, to, to not only be all in in what we give, but also all in in doing it well for the Lord. That this would be exactly what he called them to do. Exactly how he wanted them to put these things together. To freely give. Because the Lord freely gives. And he wants us to be like him. Verse 10. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out. You shall overlay it and make on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark. And the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark and they shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark of the testimony which I will give, give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above the covering of the mercy seat. With their wings they shall face one another. Their faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you. And I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony. And everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. All right, so a lot going on. There's going to be six, six pieces of furniture or articles, things that will be in or used in the, the worship at the tabernacle. And so the Lord begins to give them the measurements, the what's up on this first piece. And so when he does, this thing, a cubit, and again, there's lots of argument over it, so I don't get that excited about it, but most commonly we just say it's, it's about 18 inches. It was a measurement from your elbow to the tip of your finger. So obviously it sometimes depended on whose arm you were measuring. But usually the most common would boil down to about 18 inches. So this thing was, you know, about 27 inches high, about 27 inches wide, and 40-some inches long. When they, would, when they would have it in the tabernacle and when it would become a part of the nation and its worship, it would oftentimes represent the power and the authority of God. The nation was often led by the ark going out front and the pillar. So why... Why this box? Why a golden box? Why would God want a golden box? I don't really know. <laughs> I 
But we'll see in it as we go on and on, we'll begin to kind of scratch the surface on it a little bit tonight, that it's a picture of Jesus Christ. Now we've, we've, known, we've touched on, we've looked at a lot in the, pa- in the past, that the Scriptures in the New Testament are clear that there are these things called types, shadows, illustrations in the Old Testament of things that are happening in the New Testament or things that they were supposed to learn and draw out of what was going on. And the mercy seat is one that we'll see really speaks of the Lord. Speaks of a lot of things, but very powerfully about the Lord. But, but first, the mercy seat. This area just below, this, this covering over this big golden box was, was a kind of a cap or a covering. And between the two cherubims, they have their wings coming across and, and touching. Um, there would be where, the, where God's glory would be, where the, where the ark was. It's from, the, it's from between those two that the Lord would speak to His people. It's interesting, and we'll turn to it later on, um, but in Numbers 7, it actually says that, that the Lord speaks from there. In Psalm 80, verse 1, 90, verse 1, and 2 Kings 9, 5, it seems to, to speak of in such a way that this was referred to as like the throne of God, as where His authority seat as he would command the children of Israel. But also very powerfully with this, this box, the Ark of the Covenant, is that once a year, on the Day of Atonement, for the sins of the nation of Israel, the high priest would sprinkle blood on it to atone for the nation's sins, to make them once again right with God for that year. So we'll peel back into that in just a minute. And so there's a lot going on in here. This was something that God was going to say is holy. You don't just touch this. In fact, as you overlay it with gold, you're going to have poles, and they're going to overlay those with gold, and you're going to have the rings and run those through the rings so that you can pack this thing. You don't, you're not going to touch it. It's holy. A guy, Uzzah, in 2 Samuel 6, verse 6 and 7, you, I know many of you are probably familiar with the story. As the nation of Israel was getting the ark back after the Philistines had stole it, a, uh, the ox stumbled and it rocked, and, and he thought it was going to hit the ground, that you know, God was going to let the ark just hit the ground and roll or whatever. And so he went and put his hand on it, and the Lord struck him and killed him. This was not something to be taken lightly. And as God gives them the details and they're going to move into this, this was something that God was very serious about. Only the high priest could go in this holy of holies where it was once a year and you couldn't, you couldn't just do what you wanted. And as we'll get in the tabernacle more and more, we'll, we'll see that, that theme develop as well more and more that, you know, you... You don't get to just worship God how you want. That's just not, not the way it works. You know, growing up, I, ta- I take that back. I did know a little bit about the tabernacle, or maybe not the tabernacle, but the Ark of the Covenant here, um, which I mostly learned from Indiana Jones. <laughs> but... We're going to see as we'll get into the tabernacle having one way in. That you didn't take, you didn't take the lid off. You, you know, there's a whole bunch of things where there's a specific prescribed way to worship the Lord and to come to Him. We'll see that continue to manifest as well in, in what Jesus had to say in John chapter 14, verse 6. That I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. God has ways. God has things that He has declared, and that's just simply the way that it is. You know, and that's, it was an interesting insight for me as, as I was growing up, and, and I would pray, and I would say a prayer, and I would use the words in the name of Jesus, and I would be calling out to 
Jehovah, but I was not going to him through the Jesus of the Bible. We don't get to just come to God however we want. You can use right words or you can do, you know, have a religious system, but you can't just do things the way that you want. So the Lord is going to teach them about that and worship repeatedly in this. But I want to run down a little bit of the mercy seat. In John chapter 1, verse 29, there's an interesting thing that is said about Jesus. And in John 1, 29, as, you know, John the Baptist had his ministry going on, and both John and Jesus had disciples, and anyways... So the next day, in, in 129, says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so we talked about that in the past, that, that Jesus was the Passover Lamb for us, and that, that Passover gave us this amazing illustration of a blood sacrificial um, atonement, this, this substitutionary sacrifice that death might pass over us. And that Jesus Christ was in fact that lamb. But here the Lord's going to teach us even more about that sacrifice and that sprinkling and that blood offering and, and what God did in that. Not just, not just that, that as He gave His life, everything that it wasn't as is, is complex as that, it also wasn't that simple. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. And I love the fact that, it's, that it just gets deeper and more beautiful. In Romans chapter 3, verse 25, it says, Whom God sent forth, speaking of Jesus, as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because His forbearance God has passed over the sins of that were previously committed. So this word, propitiation, you know, we, we kind of used it, we've used it, like NASA used it as a propitiatory shield on the front of the, um, what was it, Challenger, so that when it would re-enter, it would take the heat, it would take the force, and the shuttle wouldn't burn up. But this word, propitiation, is, it, it is that, it's that covering. But, in, in Paul's day and in Jesus' day, they had this translation that I've mentioned a number of times called the Septuagint. It was common as the King James was 50 years ago. Everybody knew it. Every, most, a lot of people used it. We know that they used it because they quoted it, um, specific references to it. But in that, it translates this word, propitiation, as mercy seat, whom God sent forth as the mercy seat, the covering by his blood. And you're kind of, well, you know, what? All right, sure. But the Lord continues to develop. 1 John 2, 2. 1 John 2, chapter 2, verse 2. The Lord says, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also the whole world. So Jesus Christ is this propitiation. And the word there is mercy seat. So as we're beginning to, as we'll begin to assemble this, and again, we'll kind of just take it lightly, and at the end of Exodus, we'll try to put it all back together. We're going to see this, this box, this ark. First off, as we start, it has this covering, this lid the place from which they would meet with God, where the glory of God would dwell, where God would speak from this place, from this mercy seat. He would lead His people from there. And that it is a covering, a propitiation for the things on the inside. Hebrews 9.4 Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4. 
And again, all the way through 8 through 10 are worth a read as we go through Exodus. But Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 4, says, Which had the golden censer, speaking of the Ark of the Covenant, in the holiest of holies, there in verse 3, um, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And so he goes in, you know, we could, even Paul says we can't get to all the details right now in the next verse. <laughs> well, sorry, that's my interpretation. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say. So we have this thing that this mercy seat that Paul says Jesus Christ has become for us, that it covers the contents that are in the, the ark, which are the Ten Commandments, the law, this Aaron's rod that budded, which was an almond bud, which speaks of the resurrection. It was the first fruit that would come out in the year. And also the manna or the bread, the substance in which they were nourished by. All within this, all under this mercy seat that would be sprinkled with blood for the atonement of the people. And now we can boldly enter the throne of grace. We can boldly come to this place, into the Holy of Holies, where God's presence, where God speaks, where the atonement is, where the commandments have been covered and kept and we can come into that now because Jesus Christ died and the high priest sprinkled the blood once for all time on a heavenly mercy seat. And this will continue to, to grow more and more as the Lord continues to teach us in this. In Hebrews 9.14, in that same chapter, it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God and cleansed your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. He did that for us. So as they would be sprinkling the blood on this mercy seat, it was supposed to be speaking to them of one that would come, where pretty soon you stop killing animals and just getting by to the next year, but once for all time, God would make a sacrifice to cover his people. But he didn't just do away with the law. But it was kept in Jesus Christ. See, because this ark, as it says, they first made it out of acacia wood, which spoke of the humanity of Christ, and overlaid with gold, speaking of the divinity of Christ. And in it, the law was kept the resurrection is spoke of, and the provision of God. And this mercy seat that was supposed to keep the law was something that, that it was even built in the way so it wouldn't just come off. Because when you come to God, you don't want to come to God with the law uncovered. You don't want to come to God without the blood. They once, just to check what was inside, took the lid off of the Ark of the Covenant. And thousands died. Reminding us that's not how we want to meet God. Uncovered. We want to meet Him through the covering of His blood. The covering of the propitiation, the mercy seat of Jesus Christ. So He also puts a couple cherubim up above that. Which is interesting to me and also gives us a little insight on some of the understanding of you shall not make any graven image of something in heaven or on earth that, that when he's speaking of that in the Ten Commandments, it, it is probably for worship purposes other than for the Lord. So if you, you know, carved out a little wooden stick dog, you're probably not in trouble because the Lord had him carve out some cherubim and put it on there. But these guys, they're kind of cool. They're always associated with the holiness and the righteousness of God. They're associated with that. They're mentioned in 13 chapters of the Scriptures and given great detail in Ezekiel chapter 1 and 10. 
So Numbers chapter 7, verse 89. Because in verse 22, it talks about them speaking to the Lord from this place where the atonement was made, where the glory of God dwells. Um, that's Numbers chapter 7, verse 89. And here, I, I referenced it earlier about the Lord speaking to them. Now, Numbers is after Leviticus. So. <laughs> Numbers chapter 7, verse 89 says, Now when Moses went into the tabernacle of meeting to speak with him, being the Lord, he heard the voice of one speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the Ark of the Testimony from between the two cherubim, and thus he spoke. So as the mercy seat where the blood was applied and the cherubim covering it and being, we find them around the Lord. Um, we see that the Lord spoke from there. And one thing it reminded me of as I was just praying and reading through it is that, that personal speaking with the Lord. It's about friendship. Really, in my opinion. When Adam and Eve could walk with the Lord, they had that right relationship with Him. When Abraham walked with the Lord by faith, he was called the friend of God. When Moses would later be challenged on his leadership, God would, God would say, you know, hey, why do you guys even challenge that? Don't you know that I speak to him as one person speaks? To another. There was something about this direct communication with the Lord at the mercy seat that was exceptionally precious. Something that was to be of great value and importance. And as the Lord has brought out in the New Testament, when his body, when he died, that veil that separated everybody from going in to speak to the Lord at the mercy seat, where only one person could go once a year, was torn from top to bottom. And the Lord said, come on in. You can come speak to me. You can come into the throne of grace. You can come in and have a relationship. No more separation. I've got the... I've, I have kept the law. I have the provision. I have the resurrection. The separation that was between us was torn. Peace has been made. Jesus said, you know, no longer am I going to talk to you like servants. I'm going to talk to you as, I want you, you, can, you need to be my friends. That is probably the poorest paraphrase ever given. So you have to look it up. But his heart, his heart was not, the Lord's heart is not Separation but fellowship. But he's going to teach first that there is this separation and there is atonement that need to be made. And one day, there was going to be the blood of the Son of God applied to the real mercy seat. And it was going to make a way. Make a way for us. So we have, we have the Ark of the Covenant. The testimony. Speaking of the Son of God. Verse 23. So you shall make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold all around. You shall make for it a frame of a handbreadth around. And you shall make a gold molding for the frame all around. And you shall make for it four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that are its four legs. The rings shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be carried with them. You shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring. You shall make them of pure gold and you shall set the showbread on the table before me always." So it moves on to this next article that's going to be in the tabernacle. The showbread, the table. Again, about 36 inches long, 18 inches wide, and 27 inches high. So made for short people, 
Everybody who's tall had to bend over. But the showbread, or the bread of the presence, the bread of the faces. This too table, um, I believe, as it will also be a picture of Jesus, is not one that was to be touched, is to be carried by poles. But on top of it were these 12 loaves, and if you look at how much flour and stuff went into them, they were probably pretty good-sized loaves of bread. But always 12, I believe, representing the presence of God's people. Here are the 12 tribes of Israel before the face of God. And it would remind the priests that they weren't just serving the Lord, but they were also serving God's people. Which, was, which is probably always good for someone who's going to serve the Lord, that that you would always be reminded that you're serving the Lord and His people. And it's just really not about you. As he would look forward and see the incense come up and see the bread of the presence, that they would remember that this is, this is about representing and bringing the people before the Lord. And so, as this was given and put forth, they would, they would remember that. And he's... And he, it's interesting to me how much stress he's going to put on, on the holiness of it all and not to touch it. But you know, it was really, it wasn't to become this overbearing God of the Old Testament. He was teaching them about him, and we're going to find out that he's teaching them about heaven. Because I want to make this one point that, on why I kind of I throw that in there. This showbread which was to only be eaten by the priests on the Sabbath. You could be killed for such a thing. Many of these things you could be killed if you broke. But was that the heart of God? Keep my rules or die? I don't think so. Because in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus, when they were walking through the grain fields, um, the Pharisees were following along, looking, hey, they're going to do something wrong, they're going to do something wrong, they're going to do something Ah, I gotcha! You guys picked off a head of grain, rubbed it, and ate it. You worked on the Sabbath. And so Jesus brings up this interesting story from the Old Testament to show them the heart of the law. In verse 3, he says, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, the bread that we were just talking about, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you have not condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord over even the, of the Sabbath. So the heart of this, all of, well, all of this, is not the do's and the don'ts but to learn that the Lord desires mercy. And he's going to spend some time teaching them that the fact that they need mercy. And he's going to spend some time teaching them of the one who is greater than the Sabbath or this tabernacle. Verse 31. You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold, and the lampstand shall be of hammered work. Its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs and flowers shall be of one Peace, And six branches shall come out of its sides, three branches of its lampstand out of one side, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch, with an ornamental knob and a flower, and three bowls made like almond blossoms on the other branch, with an ornamental knob and a flower. And so the six branches that come out of the lampstand on the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with the ornamental knob and flower. And there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same, according to the six branches that extend from the lampstand. Their knobs and their branches shall be of one piece, all that it shall be one hammered piece of pure gold." You shall make seven lamps for it, and they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it. And the wick trimmers and their trays shall be of pure gold, 
it shall be made of a talent of pure gold with all its utensils, and see, it is that you make them according to the pattern which I have shown you on the mountain. Whew. May have to turn the heat down to read some of that so we don't fall asleep. No, it... The Lord has so much going on in these. The candlesticks, a lot of these would look, look basically like what you see a menorah look like today. So you'd have the, the main shaft going up with a lamp on top and three coming out on side and seven total. The lamps on the top would be like on a little swivel and they could trim the, the wicks and so on and so forth. But as it continues on the picture of Jesus Christ, and once you got in the tabernacle, it had layer after layer of skins and coverings, as we'll see on it, each one representing something. But as you would enter in, this was the only light. There was no other light inside of there. It's being the same in, in this life. Not only the Scriptures, the Word, but the Word of God. As John said in the Gospel, 8, 12, Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. It's the only way we're going to see. It's the only thing that brings light. So this thing had almonds and fruit and so on and so forth. Jesus being the first fruits and the resurrection, and he is the light. But in verse 40, he closes it out with, this is a pattern from the Lord. And we found out, and we have found out, and we'll continue to find out in Hebrews, that, it, that the Lord showed him a specific pattern in heaven. And we find as we go into Revelation chapter 4 and 5 that all of these things are in heaven. It was a pattern and a picture, a testimony to the world, and prepares us for when we get there. So I want to look at a few things as we kind of close on this chapter. First Chronicles chapter 28, speaking of patterns, first Chronicles 28, verse 11 and 12, and then I'll also read verse 18 and 19 from there. Just to kind of set the stage a little bit. Here he says, Then David gave his son Solomon plans for the vestibule, its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat. Speaking of having Solomon build the temple. And the plans for all that he had by the Spirit. So all the plans that he had were by the Spirit. And the courts of the houses of the Lord. And all the chambers all around it. And the treasuries of the house of God. And the treasuries for the dedicated things. We're of the Spirit of God. Verse 18 and 19 he says it even further. And refined gold by weight for the altar of incense. And for the construction of the chariot. That is the gold cherubim that spread their wings and overshadow the ark of the covenant of the Lord. All this, David said, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the works of these plants. So God, in Exodus, is giving them plans to worship the Lord in their life, fundamental things in their life of how to worship him, how to follow him, how to listen to him, so on and so forth. So does he do that for us today? Does he have that pattern as he's speaking and building these things for us today? Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. The Lord says through the Apostle Paul, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling speaking of their deliverance from the issues they had going on in the church. He says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God is working in them. God is working in us to do and to will his good pleasure. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, or verse 19 through 22, says this, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles, prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, 
in whom the whole building being fit together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So God is working in the church corporately, not only here in one, one building, but also across His world. And He is building and fitting together this building. And I, and I, I wish this side of heaven, he, he revealed more of the intricacies and the beauties of that as He did with the tabernacle. But, but as we walk by faith, we understand that He is putting together something amazing and specific. But how about personally? Ephesians 2.10 For we are His workmanship. That's His masterpiece, His poem, if you will. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He's working in the body as a whole, and He's putting you over there and you here and calling Him and maybe pulling them out, whatever. Because he has a plan and he is building a temple greater than Solomon's and greater than the tabernacle. And he has plans and he is working in your life personally. And so as he begins to give you personally instructions and walk with you, he was exceptionally clear with the tabernacle. This is important because this is not only has to do with heavenly things, but it's also about the testimony to the nations. And I want you to freely and willingly give yourself to these things. And do them exactly as I tell you because it matters. And the same is true in your life today. He is doing something in your life. He is making you in to His workmanship, His masterpiece. And He is taking that masterpiece and He's fitting it together with His other people to build something holy and amazing. And I think it's going to blow our minds one day when we get to heaven and see, man, the tabernacle was nothing. What he was doing in the church, that was pretty crazy. Because we see things like pillars in the, the new Jerusalem that will have the apostles' name on it. We see things, or maybe it's the gates, sorry. We see things like we'll be clothed in white, which is the righteous acts of the saints. We know that Jesus right now is preparing a place for us, and I bet, I won't bet. I'm I'm intrigued that I think that as much as we see the the similarities and the interaction and the reflection of the tabernacle of heavenly things and the temple of future things, that what Jesus Christ is doing in the church today, corporately and personally in you, as He leads you and walks with you and you obey Him, how much I bet when we get to heaven will be like whoa. That was more important when I listened to him that day or built that into my life than I ever thought. The Lord was working something heavenly out through. I don't know. Anyway, that's just the crazy wanderings of my brain, but I think, I think it's going to be pretty cool. <laughs> Let's pray. Father... Uh, Lord, teach us through your word. We know that you took Moses up on a mountain and spent 40 days with him, giving him instructions, maybe even giving him a bit of a heavenly tour as we see that these things were a copy, an architect's picture of things that were in heaven. Lord, give us the words and skills to see it all across the scriptures to see you in each one of these articles, to see the tabernacle itself, Lord, as just an, another instruction of, of who you are and who you want to be to us. Lord, bless these guys this week. Lord, help us to uh, not lose our walk in the Spirit and the craziness of Christmas, Lord, but to love and to bless you. In Jesus' name.